virgin most powerful radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, and it's great to be with you today. Yes, I am Gary Machuda, your host and sensei for today. It's great to be with you. Uh, got a great show in store for you. You know, I love it when we mix up topics. Today's topic is a fascinating one. Actually, it's a very uh, important uh, apologetic for Christian apologetics. And we're going to talk about Islam, and specifically, specifically the holy book of Islam, known as the Quran. And uh, you know, as you know, Muslims believe that uh, Muhammad received uh, uh, communication from Allah through an angel, and that that communication was eventually written down. And uh, the question is, okay, how are all these supposed revelations? gathered together and put into a book form, you know, canonical form. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how the Quran became canonical. And to uh, work us through this, we have our very good friend, Dr. Brian Bradford, coming on on the other side of the break. And we're going to talk about that. Like, how uh, did this canonical form, uh, how was it put together? Are there other versions of the Quran? Um, is this the, uh, is the final version, uh, the oldest or the most original? We'll, we'll find out with Dr. Uh, Bradford after the first break. And also, as always, we have our finding of the fallacy. Today's finding of the fallacy, by the way, is the misleading vividness fallacy. And we also meet an early church father. Today's early church father is St. Prosper of Aquitaine. So, uh, God Great stuff in store for us today. It's going to be a lot of fun. And speak about fun, let me uh, give my welcomes to all of you fun people watching a live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and all those other platforms. Welcome aboard, folks. Great to see familiar names there in the chat room. Also, I uh, want to welcome all of you fun people listening on radio around the country and also via podcast around the world. So, hi to you, folks. Hope everybody is doing fine uh, let's see, uh, if you have a question for Dr. Bradford, you could always give us a call at 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Or you can always send an email to questions at handsonapologetics.com. That's the official dojo mailbox. And, um, I do answer those emails, by the way. So keep them coming, folks. Uh, let's see, anything else that I need to talk about before the show? Actually, um, I got, uh, you know, actually the Sensei has a lot of things on on the burners. Uh, I have a manuscript that uh, is possibly going to be picked up and produced. Love to talk about that. I'm also going to do two back-to-back debates on the Old Testament canon with Steve Christie, the author of Why Protestant Bibles Are Smaller. That's going to be free on uh, live streamed on YouTube. Uh, that'll be in July. I'll let you guys know more about it as the date gets closer. Uh, just so many things happening here in the dojo, you know, and uh, that's good. Pr- thanks be to God. I'd rather be too busy for the Lord than sitting around, uh, you know, playing a game on my phone so anyway uh that being said being busy why don't we get busy with the program shall we and let's jump into our finding the fallacy as you know every program we pick out an informal fallacy to uh kind of learn and so uh we put in our toolkit in case we encounter it out there in the field today's finding the fallacy is misleading vividness And it is a fallacy in which a very small number of particularly dramatic events are taken to outweigh a significant amount of statistical evidence. And this sort of reasoning, quote-unquote, has 
the following form. Dramatic or vivid event X occurs and is not in accord with the majority of the statistical evidence. So pretty easy to remember. Uh, maybe we could make it a little less uh, witty and technical and just basically say this. Misleading vividness occurs when somebody puts forward a very dramatic but atypical event as uh, proof or to kind of give a counterbalance to the rest of the evidence. This occurs an awful, awful, awful lot, uh, not only in apologetics, but especially in everyday life. For example, uh, when someone's coming out with a, a new legislation or a new bill that they want to promote or a hit piece against a candidate or something, they will trot out uh, you know, some very uh, gripping, sad, uh, almost horrific stories about people who would have been helped by this legisl legislation or something like that. But what's never presented is those are very, very, very rare. And a vast majority of people would never, ever encounter it. And it wouldn't benefit, the, the bill wouldn't benefit. In fact, it probably hurt the majority. But nevertheless, it's so gripping and so vivid that, you know, these uh, these uh, stories that tug at your heartstrings, you know, they seem to outweigh all the statistical evidence. Uh, so... Uh, Okay, so uh, that's what occurs with misleading vividness, and uh, very good. So that's our finding of the fallacy for today. I know all of you have experienced it. I've experienced it as well. So why don't we jump to the Meet the Early Church Fathers for today. Today's Early Church Father is St. Prosper of Aquitaine, who died sometime after A.D. 455, so a little bit later, Early Church Father. I don't think he's very well known, but I think he should be. Um, as uh, Jurgen's Faith of the Early Fathers tells us, it's not not very much is known about Saint Prosper, uh, and even the little that we do know are gleaned from his own works, namely that he was a monk in Marseille. Uh, he was not in clerical orders. He was a friend of Hilary of Poitiers, uh, who. Uh, wrote a letter, number 226 in the corpus of Augustine's letters. But unlike Hillary, uh, he had no personal acquaintance with St. Augustine. Uh, soon after Augustine's death in August of 430, Prosper and Hillary went in person to Rome where they asked Pope Celestine I to issue a formal condemnation of the heresy known as semi-Pelagianism. At that time, it was known as Marseillanism. Uh, Celestis uh, did, in fact, issue a letter to the bishops of Gaul, which is modern-day France, uh, generally condemning uh, the uh, Pelagianism but, uh, and commending Augustine, by the way. But he didn't outrightly condemn semi-Pelagianism. In fact, he only enjoyed a kind of silence on the disputed points in regards to this heresy. So beginning in 432 A.D., Prosper himself commenced to draft, uh, drift away from the strict interpretation of Augustinian theology. Uh, he no longer held, as Augustine once did, to the predestination to damnation, uh, that is, prior to any foreknowledge of a man's deserts. Uh, he did continue to see, however, that the root of Pelagian and semi-Pelagian errors is the teaching that is central to him, namely the thesis that grace is given to men in accord with their merits. Uh, when Pope uh, Pope St. Leo the Great became Bishop of Rome in 440 A.D., Prosper came down again from Gaul and was uh, given a post in the Papal Chancellery. Uh, according to Grenadinius of Marseille, uh, it was Prosper who drafted certain letters of Pope Leo against Eutyches and Monophysism. Uh, Prosper uh, cannot be found alive after 455 A.D. And if you listen to this program long enough, you know, that's usually when historians believe that the person dies. It's just simply we don't hear from them anymore. So um, normally I would go and talk about some of his writings and even read some quotes, but uh, he's, he's instrumental in something that I think a lot of Catholic apologists ought to know. Um, 
And so here's our apologetics hack, okay? I think every Catholic apologist ought to be familiar with an obscure council called Second Orange. Second Orange met in 529, and it's not an ecumenical council. It's a local council, but it's a very important local council. Uh, We don't have any of its decrees. Its decrees come in form of canons, okay, which basically... Uh, say whoever denies this is anathema, that type of thing. Now, why is Second Orange important? Well, it's aimed at Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, and it uses a lot of St. Prosper's ideas and works, along with Augustine. And it's a very important counsel for apologists because if you ever are unsure of what is the product of God's grace, what do we contribute to salvation, or justification, you know, where is that boundary line that's so important when you're talking to uh, our separated brethren in Protestantism? Uh, read the canons of Second Orange, because uh, they will make you humble, and also they're incredibly clear and helpful. In fact, uh, whenever I'm, I'm talking to uh, Protestants, uh, I often suggest that they read the canons of Second Orange, Because uh, if you look at the decree on justification at the Council of Trent, which met to uh, condemn certain aspects of Protestantism, you'll find out that these thoughts in Second Orange run throughout uh, that whole session. And uh, it's very important, and I think it's incredibly helpful to dispel this mistaken belief that Catholics are somehow believing works righteousness. Well, read Second Orange, and uh, that will change your mind. I hear the music coming up, which means we're coming up to our first break. Coming up on the other side of the break, God willing, we are going to have Dr. Brian Bradford. We're going to talk about how the Quran became canonical. Stay tuned, folks. My mom's gonna have a baby. She is? Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is gonna be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody, to Hands On Apologetics. Well, you know, as I announced, uh, Dr. Brian Bradford is going to come on, and we're going to talk about how uh, the Quran uh, became canonical. But unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control, our phone lines are down. So as our engineer, Richard, bravely and uh, with due diligence tries to revive communication so we could have our guest on, uh, I'm just going to jump to what one of my favorite topics, which is books, and uh, I'll give you some uh, of my top shelf recommendations for apologetics works. And God willing, you know, we'll have the phones up and running. We'll get Dr. Bradford on, on the show as soon as possible. So hang tight, folks. Sorry for the tease, you know, but, uh, you know, all good things come to those who wait. And nevertheless, I mean, it gives me an opportunity to talk about some really good apologetic works that are out there that you may or may not know. So let me give you my uh we, we've gone over this uh, list a few times, but we haven't gotten to the advanced apologetic works. Uh, these works are pretty heady stuff. Okay, so uh, you're going to need a good constitution to dive into it, uh, a pretty decent understanding of the faith. and uh, But they're well worth the struggle of wrestling with it because there is gold in them that are hills. But like I said, they're not the most easily accessible books in terms of understanding and reading. Uh, my first top shelf book recommend for the advanced apologist is uh, a book called Politicizing the Bible by Han and Weicker. Uh, this was put out by Ignatius Press a few years ago. Of course, everybody's familiar with Dr. Scott Hahn, and you might be familiar with Benjamin Weicker. He's written a number of very popular uh, works in uh, philosophy and, and other things. And they combine to uh, talk about how textual criticism developed before most scholars claim it started. So they look at the historical roots that ultimately led to scholars um, uh, calling it the question the veracity of the Bible, you know, having this hermeneutic of suspicion. So they go all the way back to, uh, I believe they start with Marcellius of Padua and Occam. They might even go a little before that. And uh, it, it's it's thick, it's pedantic, it's hard to work through, um, but there's some incredible insights in this book as far as how politics played into it, how... Uh, uh, the unity of the church plays into it, uh, power struggles, and all these ultimately bring forth the bad fruits of secularism and higher criticism. So I highly recommend it for those who are erstwhile and a pretty, uh, fairly good level of knowledge in history and scripture. Uh, it's called Politicizing the Bible. If you're not you might do well to go on YouTube, look up. Uh, I know Dr. Han has done a couple of talks on the book where he kind of brings it down a couple of levels. And nevertheless, uh, some really interesting insights into uh, biblical criticism and stuff. So Politicizing the Bible is number one on my advanced list. Another book, which maybe is unfair to call it advanced, but it, it does uh, require somebody who... Uh, uh, is philosophically minded, at least you like philosophy. And this is a fantastic book. In fact, I think it's one of the best books out there in theistic apologetics. It's called Five Proofs for the Existence of God by Edward Fazer. Um, it's uh, spelled F-E-S-E-R, but it's pronounced Fazer. Um, Five Proofs for the Existence of God is a fantastic work. Uh, first, uh, Unfortunately, you know, when you look at it, you think five proofs for the existence of God. He must be talking about Aquinas' five ways to prove that God's existence, and, and he doesn't. Actually, they're different proofs. Uh, he does use one of Aquinas' ways, and he uses another of Aquinas' arguments that's not part of the five ways. But he goes into uh, Plotinus. He goes into Aristotle. Uh, he goes into uh, Augustine. Uh, fascinating stuff, and I think it's accessible to people. If you're if you're interested in learning uh, uh, some great arguments for God's existence and His divine attributes, 
so you have the, you know, you have that courage, the audacity to jump into a philosophical work. Uh, jump into this. He he doesn't get too abstract. He tries to keep it as uh, accessible as possible. He also tries to anticipate objections, and that's also very very helpful as well. And uh, for my money, if someone said, "Hey," Give me a book that gives uh, good, solid reasons why I should believe God exists. I would give him Phaser's book, Five Proofs for the Existence of God. Um, it's, uh, like I said, I think it's accessible, but you kind of have to be willing to dive into philosophy. So if you're going to be arguing about God's existence, you're going to have to use philosophy, folks. And so, you know, that's kind of just par for the course. That's my second book recommend. For the advanced apologist, um, by the way, for those who are tuning in late, our guest, Dr. Brian Bradford, is going to come on. We're going to talk about how the Quran became canonical, but we're having technical difficulties, so I am just going through this uh, recommend list. All right. Now, this one, I can't really pick a book, but it's like a series of books. It's put out by Ignatius Press, and the author is Father uh, Spitzer. We've had Father Spitzer on the show, by the way, a couple of times. And he's written a wonderful series of books uh, aimed at theistic and Christian apologetics. And the titles are Light That Shines in Darkness, Finding True Happiness, God So Loved the World, and The Soul's Upward Yearning. Uh, this is a fantastic series. I Actually, I, it's not as pedantic, if you will, like uh, politicizing the Bible. But I think he gives some very, very compelling arguments for things like not only God's existence, but also uh, uh, the transcendental uh, desires. I think he's probably the best person out there on that topic. In fact, I had him on the show. We talked about the transcendental desires. It's extremely good if you're talking to someone who's struggling with the idea of a soul. You know, do we have an immortal soul? Uh, he gives lots of evidence for that. He gives evidence for the afterlife, uh, basic uh, Christian apologetics as far as the historicity of of Jesus and the Gospels. Uh, lots of great stuff. So this is actually four books, and I'll give you the titles once more, by Father Robert Spitzer, who is the head of the Magister, uh, uh, was it Magister uh, Institute, I believe. And the titles are... Light That Shines in Darkness, Finding True Happiness, God So Loved the World, and The Soul's Upward Yearning. Uh, it's it's very good, folks, and it's multiple arguments in each each book. So if you're reading an argument and you're like, yeah, I can't really follow this, uh, I don't know if it would work, I'd probably never use it, don't really understand it, skip it. Go to the next chapter, because it kind of does something usually very different. Uh, very, very helpful. But like I said, it's it's a little bit more advanced, uh, so you, you do have to be willing to, um, you know, uh, have uh, some capacity for philosophical thought, things like that. Um, let's see. So for anything Father Spitzer puts out, is, you know, that's pretty darn near the gold standard, in my opinion. Uh, here's a surprising work. Uh, this is uh, an older work, but I think it's a very important work. It's called The Myth of Religious Violence by Kavanaugh. Um, this is an academic work. And I, with my own manuscript, with uh, Revolt from Reason, this is one of those handful of books that I really pivot off of because he comes up with a very interesting point about this idea of religious violence. And uh, I... Okay, here's a spoiler alert, folks. I'll tell you what the main thesis is. But he basically lays out the history of this idea of religion, quote-unquote. He shows that in Christianity, religion wasn't anything like how uh, we use that uh, term today, but rather uh, religion was considered a virtue. It was uh, Religion could be applied to something you do in civic duty, it could be applied to something uh, that we would consider secular today. But any kind of duty was considered religious. Um, and it wasn't until the Enlightenment that religion, quote unquote, was invented and kind of put into a box separate from the rest of life 
and segregated from the rest of the society. So you have religion and the state. So um, Kavanaugh does a great job showing this invention, and it's it's one of those things that we suffer with um, even today because uh, religion becomes kind of compartmentalized. It's basically a private sphere that is supposedly has nothing to do with the rest of life. So anyway, uh, I hear that our guest is on the phone, and uh, that's my book recommends. So thank you for bearing up with us. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's bring our guest on without further ado. In fact, I, uh, Dr. Brian Bradford, I, I think uh, you could probably give a short intro about uh, how you got interested in the topic, and let's talk a little bit about Islam. Hi, Gary. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, great. Wonderful. I, I love using Zoom. It's my first experience, so I'm glad it's working. So. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I got interested in uh, in Islam back, uh, geez, it's, it's a 20-year anniversary this month, actually, when I was in Israel, when I was finishing my bachelor's degree, when I was walking around the Temple Mount and going to the Dome of the Rock, um, going to the other Islamic holy sites, the al Aska Mosque, and trying to converse with the local Muslim authorities about the history of all these shrines and these uh, structures. And where does it say in the Quran this happened? Where does it say Muhammad came here? And I began getting a lot of different answers from different people. And that really opened up my eyes as to, okay, let's look into the structure of this, the history of that, the history of this, the Quran itself, Muhammad himself, what do the sources say and how reliable is everything when it comes to understanding the Muslim interpretation of their own religion and their own prophet and their own holy book. And that's what kind of got me interested in all this material. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So uh, we, we're coming up on a break. We have about a minute and a half. Maybe you could just explain what is the Quran, just for people who aren't familiar with Islam. Well, the Quran, it means recitation. It refers to the 114 chapters that were supposedly uh, dictated to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel over a 22-year period. It's believed to be the only true, absolute, um, uncorrupted, infallible word of God in the history of human civilization. It has surpassed, replaced, and superseded every previous religious text, primarily the Old and New Testament, the Bible, because that's the context that it takes. And they say that it's perfect today. It uh, resembles the perfect tablet that's preserved and guarded in heaven. And that's a good summary of exactly what it is and how difficult it is to look at it for any type of criticism. Oh, very good. All right. Well, we're chatting with uh, Dr. Brian Bradford. About how the Quran became canonical. Stay tuned, folks. More to come on the other side of the break. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the Internet. And every time we tap into the Internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eyes to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code BMPR to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com code VMPR live porn free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, 
a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And we're chatting with Dr. Brian Bradford. Uh, by the way, he received his Ph.D. from Western Michigan University in Early Islamic Studies. He's written several books. Uh, you should check it out, like Arabian Religion Before Muhammad and Surah 135 in Chronological Order. And also Muhammad's Jesus, Quran Parallels with Non-Biblical Text. And, yeah, so Dr. Bra- uh, Bradford, uh, so... Purportedly, Muhammad was given these uh, revelations from God, and uh, was it? A, uh, did he immediately write them down? Uh, what, kind of take us through the transmission of this. Well, the transmission. Uh, one thing you have to remember, Gary, about all this is that all the Islamic sources come at least two hundred to three hundred years after Muhammad died. So we have to ask, okay, how accurate are all of these? But the basic Islamic interpretation is, after Muhammad received this first revelation in the cave from Angel Gabriel, he was terrified. He thought he was possessed, and he wanted to jump off a cliff and kill himself. But Gabriel said, no, you're you're uh, Muhammad, you're God's apostle, and I'm Gabriel, so just keep listening to this, and then you know we'll see what happens. Basically, he dies in the year 632, And at that time, the revelations pretty much automatically come to an end because he's not going to be getting any more. And the problem was in society at that time that when he died, the uh, nomadic tribes who had converted to Islam suddenly abandoned Islam. And according to the tribal traditions, Muhammad's death nullified the economic tribute they were to pay to him. So the first caliph, Abu Bakr, has to con- conduct the first case of jihad against these tribes to bring them back into the fold. And the fear was um, a lot of these revelations would be lost because there was a lot of, I think several hundred people died in a particular battle in the year 634. And the fear was, since Muhammad relied on the oral transmission of these, if these were forgotten by his followers, that they would be forgotten entirely forever Mm. so they decided to okay we have to get a collection we have to get all these revelations that muhammad had from the year 610 up to about the year 632 and get them for society so we have proper religious belief and religious conduct and that's what kind of triggered the whole idea that they had to collect everything okay yeah so uh the collection of uh you know the these uh sayings of muhammad um, was all of them uh, put down in writing that eventually became the Quran, or is it? What's the relation with the hadiths, the oral tra- uh, tradition? Because uh, it sounds like it's almost like the same thing. They're all coming from oral tradition. Right, right. That's what Islamic, or I guess you could even say pre-Islamic Arabian society in general was based on oral traditions. Yeah. And the Hadith, for example, are anecdotal sayings attributed to Muhammad that don't come along until the 9th and 10th century. And there was over 600,000 of those collected, but only about 7,200 were kept and considered authentic. The other ones were thrown out because they were considered spurious and not really accurate. Okay. Uh, there's a very important individual. His name is Zaid ibn Thabit, who was considered the first poetic defender, which is a strange term because poets and reciting poetry is kind of condemned in the Quran itself, but he was considered Muhammad's poetic defender, meaning that uh, he would 
counteract any attacks on Mohammedan society with verses from the Quran or any type of poetic inventions that would guard Muhammad against a lot of these critical attacks. People are saying, for example, the Quran says that Muhammad was just repeating old stories. These are just stories from the ancients. We've heard these before. This is nothing new. But then strategically, Zayed ibn Thabit, who was also uh, assisted by Gabriel, according to the Hadith, to attack people and abuse them with his poetry to excel Muhammad in society and kind of degrade anybody else who was saying uh, negative things about his revelations. Apparently, when he ran around, you know, Ibn Thabit, when he was commissioned to collect all these verses, they were written down on palm leaves, pieces of bone, pieces of pottery, and even upon going into Muhammad's actual personal residence, he found everything scattered about and not really any type of chronological order or arrangement. And there's actually one hadith that says it would be easier for me to move a mountain than it would be to collect these because Allah's apostle, meaning Muhammad, did not even leave a collection. So even in the hadith, Gary, we have cases where you don't have a completely bound chapter 1 through chapter 114 in exact order Quran that does not exist, arguably up until even the 10th century, some people even say that even that late, the Quran wasn't even really put together yet. So there's still a lot of debate, even when you look at the Islamic sources themselves. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> so it, it, there's a large body of writings and uh, uh, material that ultimately needs to kind of be put into order, I suppose, and, and made into an authoritative collection. Right, because one of the problems with early Islam was you had several different main cities. You had cities in Iraq, uh, cities in the Arabian Peninsula, who had people reciting the Quran in different dialects. And this led to, I guess, some say major, some say minor cases of vocabulary that would affect theology, that would affect prayer and ritual. And then eventually you have the Caliph Uthman, about the year 650, who says, okay, we can't do this anymore. We have to have one codified collection. They have to all match and be in the same dialect. So anything that varied from what he wanted was gathered up and burned and destroyed. So there would be only one Quran and one dialect. But that was even another problem because in the, the script that was used uh, called Kufic, it's kind of like black letters of, of Arabic. There's no vowel markings. So you can have one word can have potentially up to 30 different meanings, depending on where you put the vowel markings. Right. And that's one of the problems that's been encountered in some of the manuscripts they have found um, in modern day Yemen. Um, some of the collections they have in Turkey, some of the oldest manuscripts they even found at, uh, in Birmingham in the UK in a library that everybody was excited about because they actually dated to Strangely enough, before Muhammad and before the Caliph Uthman had this organized and put together in the year 652. So there's still a lot of textual criticism and discrepancies that are still being found as early as, uh, or as recently, I should say, as 2017 and 2018 when it comes to deciding if the Quran is an actual document today that is perfectly matched to the older texts. And the science says it's not even close, actually. Wow. So you're talking about does is the canonical text that uh, that uh, Islam possesses today is it identical to Uthman's collection? And the answer is no. Well, uh, do I understand they, that correctly? They all date to the manuscripts we have today. All date to at least the 750s or even later. There's nothing that dates to the Uthman period, about the year 650 or so. So that's a problem when they try to argue that uh, the way it was revealed to Muhammad and he recited it is perfect and unaltered from then until today. And that's that's not the case. Very interesting. You know, my question is, Caliph Uthman, you know, what competency did he have to declare we're going to have one Quran and this is the standard? And, you know, do uh, Muslims think of him as being in some sense inspired to do this? It's conceived, it's conceived more of a political 
temporal type of organization. When you, we talk about uh, the Bible, for example, the inspired writers of the New Testament and that sort of thing, they don't really have that type of same concept that we do. It was more political, used for religious and political control to uh, have one collection that was in one dialect so everybody could believe the same thing. And Uthman has different scholars say different things about him. Some say he was important. Uh, for example, I guess we could compare Constantine in our own tradition. Was he good or was he bad for getting the Nicene Creed and getting a standardized form of belief? It's kind of a similar situation. But even after Uthman's collection, there was still discrepancies. You had different dialects and you had people that relied on the memories of different people who had recited it along with Muhammad. And there was anywhere from, I think the sources say from seven up to nine of these copies that were sent out to these main cities. But still after that, there was still discrepancies among, well, we can say it in the, the dialect of the Quraysh, which is Muhammad's tribe. But if you live in North Africa or Syria or over in parts of Turkey, it's going to be just a naturally different dialect because of this, the geographical differences. And it didn't really end up being the exact unifying text that they thought it would be. So it led to problems anyway. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Now in terms of the canonical form, uh, you know, with Uthman, he was in 650. If, if memory serves me correctly, didn't St. Uh, John Damascene uh, mention books being in the Quran that aren't in the modern Quran? That's right. Yeah. Um, St. John of Damascus and his, I think it's the fount of knowledge is the text that he wrote. And he calls uh, Islam just a, he doesn't call it a heresy even. In Greek, the word is skia, which means like a darkness or like a, even in the New Testament, that word means the shade of the shadow of death. So it's a very ominous term that he uses when he describes Islam. And he talks about the black stone that they worship in the Kaaba. This is just the head of an, uh, a deity that was carved to look like Aphrodite. And he does mention some verses that are not even found in the Quran. He has different chapters and verses that don't even exist. He mentions a few other passages that are completely out of order compared to the new or compared to the standardized Quran of today. So he's a very important source to look at. He's writing, I think, in the late. 740s, I think. I think he died around 750. And he says it's all superstition. Uh, Muhammad's not a real prophet because it came to him during his sleep. And um, it may be a, a very eye-opening case if, to read that. And it's very important to look at John of Damascus, what he says, because he predates yeah. the Islamic sources by almost 200 years, what he writes about Muhammad and his life, which is very interesting. Yeah, yes, indeed. We're chatting with Dr. Brian Bradford about how the Quran became canonical. Stay tuned, folks. You're listening to Hands on Apologetics. We'll be right back. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's an on-fire Catholic, and he promotes the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Daniel, what a testimony, and I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. Healthcare news today seems to be coming from everywhere and everyone. It's confusing, at least, and untrustworthy at the worst. 
Dr. Asetta is a faithful Catholic in the Kern County community. He is trustworthy, well-researched, and will only give expert opinion on matters in his own specialty. Catholic teaching at its entirety is of utmost importance to Dr. Asetta. Give Dr. Asetta a call for your obstetrics and gynecological needs at 661-695-6617. 661-695-6617. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee... They will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And we are chatting with Dr. Brian Bradford about uh, how the Quran became canonical. And uh, Dr. Bradford, I have to congratulate you. You know, this could be a couple of programs worth of material. And you just took one segment and you covered a lot of what I was expecting the whole show to cover. Uh, so kudos to you. Um, yeah, it's it's a very but, complicated topic, but it's, it's important for uh, Christians to understand exactly what it is because there may be a time when you're forced to be in a type of a apologetic situation or some of, you know, polemical situation, and you have to know exactly what we're up against when you get in a debate with somebody about this topic. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Especially since, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Muslims believe the Quran, the actual literal dictation of Allah without any human agency being, you know, secondary author being involved. So each word literally is what Allah spoke to Muhammad. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. And if you try to even take apart literally just one word and place a different vowel here or look at a different interpretation, that's that's something that they heavily frown upon when you try to do something of that nature. That happened uh, when they did some scientific forensics on the leading manuscripts that were discovered. Um, if you want me to get into that briefly, I could do that. Oh, yeah, sure. That sounds fascinating. The, uh, I think it was back in 2002 and 2007, uh, the two, well, I think the leading uh, manuscript collections are in Turkey, uh, the British Library, Cairo, Yemen, and I think there's one in Uzbekistan of all places as well. They found out that all of these date to at least 750 or later, and they vary in some cases, uh, in thousands of variations of letters, words, chapters, verses with the standardized Quran. For example, hmm. some of these only have 43 of the 114 chapters. And as I mentioned, there's thousands of grammatical variations. And for example, the one found in uh, Yemen in 1972 actually has two texts. The underlying text was actually washed or scrubbed off and the text on top was replaced. And both of them, when you look at them, different uh, have very different variations from the standardized Quran of what we have today. Hmm. And the, the Birmingham text that was found uh, in 2015, 2016, really sent the world into quite a stir because it was carbon dated to 568, between 568 and 645 which actually predates Muhammad's birth and Uthman's composition of 652. So that was a, a point that I found the Islamic world didn't really talk about or debate or acknowledge. And further studies of that particular manuscript show us it only has chapters 18, 19, and 20 of the Quran. And this is significant because these contain the legend of the seven sleepers, which are a, a Christian tale, which date to about the year 520. Chapter 19 is the apocryphal stories about the birth of Jesus, you know, when he speaks in the cradle as a baby and that sort of thing. And chapter 20 recounts the story of Moses from the Bible. 
So when you get down to it, they're not even original compositions, yet they're considered the oldest Quranic verses. So that doesn't really make sense that it's embellished to be the oldest existing manuscript of the Quran. Yeah. Yeah, boy, that's surprising. Um, so in what sense is it Quranic if it, it includes all these you know, extra canonical Quranic material? Exactly the question. I mean, how do you yeah. oppose that? <laughs> if it's the infallible word of God and you point out that these sources existed in some cases as early as the, the third century, and all they'll say in return when I've asked Muslims this at various lectures and other meetings I've had, uh, they just say Allah knows best and throw their hands up in the air and that's it. They say the Quran of today is the Quran that uh, Allah wished to be in existence, and there you have it. So that's the end of the conversation from there. Okay. And when you try to present scientific facts and the forensics of these documents, it's not really something they want to engage in because uh, they're so, you know, they have a strong faith and they're engaged in that heavily, and they don't want to look at any type of textual criticism which is it's difficult when you present them with facts, but um, it, it's it still inspires us that we have to have some type of truth on our side when we get in these type of debates, I believe. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, you wrote the book uh, Arabian Religion Before Muhammad, and you show all these pre-Islamic uh, kind of roots of, uh, you know, that ultimately uh, parallel with Islam. Uh, is there an official stance in terms of uh, uh, whether the Quran could contain any pre-Muhammadan material? They say, the scholars that I have talked to over the years, if there's anything, like I've asked them, and I pointed out chapter 19 talks about the birth of Jesus, and he talks in the cradle as a baby, and Mary gives birth under a tree, and the tree talks to her, and that sort of thing. When you point out that these are apocryphal stories that you can look at documents from the third century. They either ignore it or they say, well, those are the official stories that the compilers of the Bible took out because they referred to Muhammad and the later uh, Quran that would be the true word. Okay. Which is kind of perplexing, of course, when you try to put <laughs> right. that in a connection to history, but it just doesn't seem to, affect them that much when you present them with with facts or scientific documents that date earlier yeah yeah so uh so these uh, outside of that are very early document uh i take it all these variations uh it sounds like that occurred after the caleb uthman had collected the canonical version of the quran i guess you could call it right right we i guess in in history <clears throat> excuse me that the the first public, I guess you could say, uh, presentation of the Quran would be on the Dome of the Rock in Israel, in Jerusalem there, that was built in 690 to 692 by the Caliph Abd al-Malik, who inscribed uh, Quranic verses on the inside of the dome. Now keep in mind, the dome is supposed to commemorate the night journey of Muhammad, flying on the winged donkey and going up to heaven and that sort of thing. But none of the verses talk about that. All the verses that are inscribed in the, in the Dome of the Rock say they're very anti-Trinitarian, they're anti-Jesus, they're anti-Jesus' divinity, uh, and they just keep repeating that. Uh, there's no, say there's only one God, you do not, not have to say three. Um, Allah is wise to himself, he does not have to have a son. So for some reason, those verses were chosen out of the entire Quran to be put on that structure to emphasize Jesus was only man, only prophet, not the son of God and not the Messiah. And interestingly, it's his son, the son of Abd al-Malik, uh, Caliph al-Walid, who rules from about 705 to 715, where we have the emergence of most of the dated manuscripts that relate to the Quran and the variations that come from North Africa or even Spain or parts of the Middle East and parts of Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. So there's something about that period that these variations really began and really began to take precedence over the standardized version that was thought to exist at the time. Interesting. Interesting. So today, uh, could we say there is one Quran or what status do these variations have as far as uh, 
you know, for the believer today? Well, it's interesting because the official standardized version of the Quran was not officially printed until 1924 in Cairo, Egypt. Hmm. And wow. it was basically for the uh, Cairo University and the Department of Education because they've been finding out students who were quoting the Quran for their work and their studies were all using different versions. Hmm. And this is called the Hafs text, H-A-F-S, and it's based on a student, his name was Hafs, who died about the year 805, and he relied on an edition that was based on something as late as 778 and way back to 690. But his original texts do not exist. They simply printed it in 1924 and said, okay, this is based on this edition, we want to have this just for Egypt, and Allah knows best is the common phrase that's applied to this, saying, well, there was different versions in North Africa, there's different grammatical spellings, different versions, and that sort of thing. But they, they respond to this, Gary, by saying, well, look at all your different Bible translations, look at your different editions. Mm -hmm. And we can say, well, it doesn't change meaning or theology or any facts or faith about Christ. But when you look at the Quran and you have only consonants and you can add vowels anywhere you want, that does greatly change what is in there as far as theology and, and even some religious practices. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. In fact, I was just going to ask you that, uh, whether uh, these variations would uh, change the meaning substantially. You know, um, it sounds like it would. Yeah, in some cases they do. In some cases it's minor. I mean, even if you look at the... Uh, Textus Receptus for the, the New Testament and some of the Greek differences. It's just, I've looked at this extensively since I, I work a lot in the Greek New Testament. It's just minor spelling variations that don't affect anything about theology. Right. But when you apply it to the Arabic language, it's, it's quite a bit different and can lead to a lot of different interpretations. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned earlier that Uthman wanted one dialect and one copy of one Quran for the entire Muslim world. But still today in 2020, that's not really the problem because, or that is the problem because there's anywhere from 26 to 31 different versions of the Quran that exist mm. that have personal prayers, chapter headings. And anytime you read a Quran that has anything in parentheses, that's technically considered a type of commentary by the printer or the publisher and not really true to the authentic Arabic text. Sure. Sure. Now, are these translations or are they Arabic? Some have Arabic on one side and English on the other side. And the real true Islamic scholars will say the Quran only has to be in true authentic Arabic because the Quran itself says uh, it was revealed in perfect Arabic to Allah, to Muhammad for the perfect language, for the perfect people. So if you want to read one in English, it, it's considered a translation, but not actually really authentic for a good interpretation. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, that's, boy, I, you know, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties because, <laughs> no, we're just scratching the surface and our, our time's almost over. Uh, but I want to uh, let people know about some of the books that you have available, uh, I guess, on Amazon. Uh, you want to say where they, uh, what those books are and uh, how they can get a hold of your other works. I have uh, Muhammad's Jesus, which was actually my dissertation that I added a few things to and published. Um, there's Arabian Religion Before Muhammad, which looks at the idea of stone worship, which is very important when we look at the Kaaba and the shrine and Mecca and that sort of thing. Uh, there's another one I did, uh, I think two years ago, that's on the, the Greek language, the original Greek, the Nicene Creed, which is important for Catholics to look at. And uh, I'm working on a few more. I'm working, one, working on one that's the Biblical Gabriel versus the Islamic and Quranic Gabriel to understand who this person was who was supposed to have given Muhammad the Quran. Thank you for coming on the show. Coming up next, Terry and Jesse. You want to stay tuned? In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. 
And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.